everybody. I'm very happy to, uh, to introduce uh, our uh, next and last keynote uh, speaker of today. It, this is, uh, it will be Hannes uh, Yusurarson from uh, Iceland. He is a professor of, poli uh, he's a, he's a professor of po politics at the University of Iceland. Um, he, he has written um, in, uh, the tw in 2021, uh, the two most written, uh, recent books are the uh, 24 Conservative Liberal Thinkers Part 1 and Part 2. You can find these books, you can see they're <laughs> quite big, but worth a read. You can find the books online, uh, you know, you can download them for free as well. And uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Gisur Arson. It's a pleasure and a privilege to uh, address this uh, very successful uh, meeting uh, of the Austrian Economic Center. I am not an economist, I am a political philosopher, so I don't go as far as uh, one of my intellectual mentors, Ludwig von Mises. Uh, a friend of mine, Samuel Husband, told me that he was uh, Mises' host in his last uh, lecture tour in San Francisco, uh, shortly before actually Mises uh, passed away. And Mises was quite old and uh, husband, some husbands was taking him and Margit von Mises uh, uh, <coughs> uh, with him in a car uh, in, in San Francisco. And then they were, and Mises was dozing off in the back seat and Margit von Mises was with him. And then they uh, passed uh, Broadway in San Francisco, where there's a lot of striptease bars. And Margit von Mises uh, said, Lou, Lou, look, naked ladies. And then uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, woke suddenly up, gave a start, and said, bad for the clothing industry. <laughs> so he was somebody who was, uh, from the beginning to the end, a true economist. I am not, so I'm actually going to speak about something quite different, which is uh, uh, the political significance of the father of the Austrian school. Uh, and uh, as was mentioned here, I discussed this in my book, uh, 24 Conservative Liberal Thinkers, the Austrian Tradition. What is interesting is that there are, in my opinion, two uh, major revolutions in e economics. Uh, one of them uh, made by Adam Smith and the other one made by Kurt Menga. I think he's one of the most important economists of all times. And uh, Smith presented us with marvelous insights that one man's gain needn't be another man's loss. And this is something that most people don't understand, even today, that uh, economics is not a zero-sum game or a negative-sum game. It is a positive-sum game where everybody can uh, benefit. And this is by division of labor, by the extent of the market. And the other very deep and profound idea that uh, Smith presented us with was the idea of uh, order without commands, coordination, spontaneous coordination, with anyone ordering us around. Very, very interesting idea, uh, still not understood by all. Menga, however, uh, he uh, began to analyze goods as units. Uh, breaking them into units, and that led uh, naturally to uh, the uh, marginal utility revolution. And by uh, marginal utility, Menger could explain value and price, and he could resolve all paradoxes of economics. So it was really uh, a path-breaking uh, exercise. And he also pointed out that even if Robinson Crusoe and Man Friday had been trading uh, to mutual benefit on the island, then uh, that's not how production in a modern society takes place. It takes place over time because you uh, plan for the future and uh, th therefore you introduce uncertainty and time and ignorance become uh, uh, concepts of ultimate uh, importance uh, in, in economic life. So this is one of the greatest insights of Austrian uh, economics. Uh, but what is interesting is, and I don't think it has been pointed out that much, that uh, once you read uh, Menger's principles, you realize that two of the most popular uh, notions in the, or political ideas of the 19th century were wrong, they were refuted. And they were both actually based upon Ricardo's uh, edition or version of, of Smithian economics. One of them was uh, Ricardo's 
uh, idea of rent. That land was special because there was a, it was in fixed supply, and therefore those who owned the land they could uh, uh, charge a rent from 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 the land. The demand might expand, but you couldn't uh, uh, produce more land. So uh, there was rent that was being generated. This was the basic idea, and this is based upon uh, Ricardo. The other idea was that uh, labor was special. Ricardo uh, thought that it was uh, labor that created value. Uh, <coughs> those two ideas uh, coming from Ricardo uh, formed the basis of uh, two very popular uh, 19th century political ideas. Uh, and uh, what the, uh, Marxism and Georgism, as I'm going to, to uh, argue. Uh, but Menga, in the principles, he uh, argues that the traditional distinction between land, labor, and capital is not necessarily relevant. That all goods are breakable into units with marginal uti utility determining price. So there is nothing special about land or about labor. And the value and price, uh, they are determined by utility for consumers of the last unit, not by cost of production. Uh, and this means that uh, Georgism and Marxism are both deprived of their theoretical uh, foundations. It's uh, difficult for us to realize now, although I'm going to argue that it's still relevant, that Georgism at the end of the 19th century was just as popular as uh, 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 Marxism. In, indeed, Hayek uh, told me and others that uh, when he was a young uh, man and was, um, he wasn't really a socialist, but he was sympathetic to uh, socialism and what he found most convincing or plausible was Boden reformers, uh, the uh, land rent uh, people. Uh, very interesting. So, Georgism was even more popular and here you can see Henry George, than Marxism. Henry George said that land was given to us, that it was a gift of God uh, or nature, and it was not produced uh, by, by, in the sweat of our brows. So landowners were exploiting other people by charging land rent. And uh, there should be a land tax expropriating uh, the land rent, and that would uh, be able to replace all other taxes. And many uh, thinkers in the 19th century, including Proudhon, the young uh, Herbert Spencer, and even uh, John Stuart Mill, they, they were sympathetic to this idea. But we have since uh, discovered that it is uh, almost impossible to distinguish between the contribution of nature and the contribution of uh, uh, man or the owner. And it's, uh, it was an error that land rent would really be crucial. What really <coughs> it doesn't really mean so much in the whole to totality of production. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Georgism had some moral appeal, and I believe it is because uh, if you see somebody that earns money from buying land at one price and s selling it two years later at another price, then we feel that he hasn't really contributed anything. But this is totally wrong, because speculation on the market is actually uh, creating value by transferring uh, capital from a less uh, profitable and productive use to a more profitable and productive use. Uh, but the old idea, stemming from the face-to-face -face society, the agricultural society, the small community in which we all were um, born in the old days, and which has uh, been the source of our traditional values, says, you know, you, you, uh, you only should get what you've earned, what you've created with your hands, what you have made in the uh, sweat of your brow. Uh, so this is uh, one of the atavistic ideas that uh, support uh, socialism. And uh, I cannot really go into it much, but I just wanted you to underline that Georgism is still alive in some places. For example, in Iceland, we have developed a very profitable and sustainable system in the fisheries with so-called individual transferable quotas. And this has meant that the owners of fishing firms, they have earned a lot of profit by virtue of being the holders of these quotas. And then there are people in Iceland that want to expropriate the profit from it. 
this is Georgism. This is just Georgism in uh, uh, disguised uh, in modern clothing. Uh, I, I will not go here into the debate about this in Iceland. If you would, I've written two books uh, which are both available in English on the, on the problem, so you can uh, uh, find them out. But I'm just mentioning this here to show you that Georgism is, is still alive in the Icelandic fisheries at least. Then another uh, thing which has not really been uh, noticed very much is that uh, John Rawls' theory of justice is really Georgism in persons. Here is John Rawls, who used to be the greatest icon of left-wing thought. Uh, I think Thomas Piketty has now um, replaced him, and the uh, very interesting contrast between uh, John Rawls and uh, Thomas Piketty is that John Rawls uh, was worried about the poor. Piketty is only worried about the rich. John Rawls wanted to lift up the poor. Uh, Thomas Piketty wants to put down the rich. Quite a, quite a difference. I, I have some sympathy with the uh, Rawlsian enterprise. I think there is an interesting question whether the society is just, which maximizes the conditions of the worst of. Okay, uh, it's uh, quite debatable. But uh, I'm not going to discuss that now here. I'm only going to point out that uh, Rawls, uh, he uh, argues that nature distributes talents randomly. Uh, so that individuals do not deserve the extra income from their talents. And this is actually Georgism, but in a different uh, uh, version. It is that you haven't earned what you uh, inherit, of talents and abilities. And therefore, you have uh, no uh, claim on the extra income which uh, you inherit uh, by the use of your talents. Just the same uh, conceptual apparatus as... Uh, Henry George had about land. Instead, it is just individual talent and abilities that uh, are in question. But I think this is erroneous, uh, that role is uh, wrong, that uh, the right kind of distribution is a distribution where marginal utilities in the Mangarian sense are involved. Uh, this is income distribution by choice. And Robert Nozick, he tells a famous story about with Chamberlain, and I will just tell this here in one minute in a different way. Let us say that Milton Friedman comes to Iceland, and uh, then uh, he holds lectures, and he sells uh, uh, admission to the lectures, and uh, each one uh, has to pay $100 for the entrance, and uh, this means, because people flock to his lectures, that uh, he will go from Iceland with, more, let us say, $100,000 in his pocket, and uh, his, uh, <coughs> the people who uh, bought themselves into the uh, lectures will each of them be poor by uh, $100. But what is wrong with this? Nothing. This was distribution by choice. You know, you are chosen. Uh, you have uh, provided the service that people are perfectly willing to, to, to purchase. And this is, this is the basis of the Will Chamberlain example in uh, Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State and Utopia, and I was just using here the example of Milton Friedman. Then we have a Mengerian and Hayekian point about it, uh, in addition to the one about choice, and in fact closely related to choice. It is that our income, if it is freely generated by choice in the market, where uh, goods and services are broken into units and then the units are traded and the marginal utility decides uh, the price of the last unit, then uh, this is information about uh, the worth of our abilities to other people and a signal to us how uh, we can best develop our talents and abilities uh, to be of benefit to other people. So there's a lot of information which is uh, contained in uh, uh, distribution by choice, uh, as Menger would have recognized. And if we begin to redistribute, if we begin to transfer income from those who have got it by choice and uh, get it to somebody else, then we are contaminating this information. We are, uh, more or less, we are more or less confusing the signals, the road signals. Uh, we are, if we want to go from... Um, from 
from Vienna to Berlin, uh, we, we suddenly put uh, on a road signal, no, don't go to Berlin, go to Warsaw. It's a confusion, it's contamination of information. Because if you do not price uh, <coughs> labor according to its marginal utility, then you are foregoing this information which is contained in the prices in the labor market. This is Georgism. And I, as I argue, uh, uh, Rawls uh, theory of justice is just Georgism in persons. But then I would like to turn to Karl Marx. And it's very interesting how Marx became a communist. He became a communist in 1842 when he was uh, uh, the editor of the Neue Rheinische Zeitung. And he saw that uh, the owners of forests in, uh, in Rhineland, they started to prohibit uh, poor people from uh, collecting dead wood. And he said, why, uh, why should you do that? Aren't the uh, owners of the forests the real thieves? Uh, because the people have been collecting dead wood uh, for centuries and so on. So he became a communist because he thought that the, you know, the owners of forests shouldn't be able to collect any charges or prices uh, from, from the poor the, in, in the forests. And this is a bit of a Georgian uh, or Georgist um, consideration. Marx uh, uh, was a, a disciple of uh, Ricardo, and uh, Paul Samuelson actually in his textbook says that uh, in uh, economic history or the history of economics, uh, Marx should be regarded as a minor disciple of Ricardo. Maybe a little bit dismissive to say so. I think he was an interesting, uh, powerful thinker, but he believed in a cost of production theory. So that wages were the cost of production, that's, uh, the, uh, that is to say, the cost for workers of staying alive and reproducing. And uh, then he uh, developed his uh, theory of exploitation uh, as a logical consequence of this uh, conceptual framework. Capitalists uh, use their bargaining power to impose longer uh, hours on people to create surplus value. But Menga, Menga actually didn't mention Marx, but he mentioned Ricardo. Menga uh, pointed out that goods, including labor, are, are valued according to their uh, marginal utility. And uh, that's basically what determines value everywhere. The reason why we uh, like old wine rather than new wine, and we uh, like new bread rather than old bread, is that we just find them better. Our subjective value determines this. But today uh, we have Marxism that dares not speak its name. Uh, we have, uh, even if Marxism has been refuted intellectually and socialism has failed everywhere, we have uh, Marxism in disguise. One of them is radical feminism, where the bourgeoisie is replaced by patriarchy, and uh, it totally ignores ma marginal utility, Menger's marginal utility. Because if, if it was actually true that there was a patriarchy which suppressed women and paid women less uh, than their worth on the market, then there would be an enormous profit opportunity to establish companies that would uh, use the talents of those people and pay them the right price. Why are, uh, why are those uh, companies not uh, existing if the radical feminists are right? It's an, uh, you know, if you just invoke Menka, then you see uh, why they are wrong. Then eco-fundamentalists, they substitute exploitation of labor with the exploitation of, of nature. We, we are, in some ways, raping Gaia, uh, the mysterious nature. Capitalism is. And uh, <clears throat> if you have read Menger's principles, then you realize that if all resources are correctly priced, then there wouldn't be any exploitation or overutilization of natural resources. And uh, the way to do so is to, uh, is to uh, construct units that are tradable. And uh, let me just give you uh, one example. Why is it that the sheep in Iceland are not in any danger of extinction, whereas the elephants in Africa are in danger of extinction? It is because the sheep in Iceland are owned. There are property rights to them whereas the elephants in Africa do not have any property rights. So what is the solution? 
it is to define property rights to the elephants and to the rhinos and to other parts of nature which are now being overexploited so that they will be priced correctly at the margin. And if it is not possible, then there is something wrong, I think, with the whole argument, if you cannot do so. So <coughs> private property is still something that uh, is, is, is crucial. And in both these cases, in the case of the radical feminism and in the case of uh, eco-fundamentalism, uh, the uh, <coughs> exploitation of, possible exploitation of women, it took place in the past, obviously, and in the over-utilization of, uh, of nature, what we have to do is to remove barriers to trade everywhere. Then, uh, finally, I come to uh, Menger's positive contribution. Uh, because uh, my argument was that if you read uh, the principles carefully, then you see that they are a refutation, a refutation both of Georgism and Marxism. But he also had a positive contribution. And uh, <clears throat> it is an analysis of the institutions that are the unintended consequences of human action. That is to say, what Hayek called spontaneous orders. And the two examples that uh, Menger gave were money and language. And... Uh, this is a, a fascinating research program. And uh, on this, uh, we can base a whole theory of the extended uh, order, like Hayek does, civil association, like Oakshet does, or the open society, like uh, Popper does. And therefore, I believe that uh, Menger uh, belongs to what I try to identify and argue for as the conservative liberal tradition. But perhaps uh, I should finally just make one observation. Uh, in September 1979, Hayek was in London. And uh, Mrs. Thatcher, who had become prime minister in May 1979, she heard about this. So she, de she decided to invite Hayek uh, to lunch at 10 Downing Street. And uh, she greeted him at the door and she said to him, Professor Hayek, I know precisely what you're going to say. You are going to say that I haven't done enough. And you're absolutely right. And Hayek told me that she totally disarmed him there. But let us uh, <coughs> follow the instructions of Mrs. Tatsa. We have not done enough. We have to continue. This has been a uh, successful conference, but there, are, there is a lot of work to do, and we have not done enough. But uh, you, can, you can find the people with the microphone on both sides. But before we start, I would like to ask Professor uh, Gisurerson, uh, because you attacked a lot on the, uh, a lot, you attacked the Georgian, uh, Georgian land tax, let's say. Um, what would, uh, and we know that neither Menger, nor Hayek, nor, nor Mises were anarchists. So what, uh, how do they, uh, what, what tax is better, let's say, from, from a moral uh, point Instead of the instead of the jo uh, Georgian land tax, well, I can tell you what really you know. If I were a hard commissarian, and I was waking up from a dose in the taxi, and I was uh, responding to uh, the question, then it would probably be uh, 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 an equal uh, contribution, uh, a community charge, an equal contribution of everybody uh, to uh, the production of, of public goods. That would really be the only just tax. But I don't think that would be politically possible. So I think that a flat income tax is uh, something that ought to be uh, done. And that's actually what uh, we did in Iceland. We had a, a comprehensive liberalization uh, program there from 1991 to 2004. And uh, we managed to uh, lower the tax and make it into a, a, a flat tax uh, over, of course, a, a tax-free minimum account. I see um, a gentleman in the back with the first question. Uh, I'm just wondering, 
you uh, speak about this eco fundamentalists, but they are defending uh, resources which somehow we can common resources which somehow belongs to all of us. So in some sense, we can interpret it as they are uh, protecting their property against uh, quick exploitation. So shouldn't liberals and libertarians support this movement in, uh, as they are protecting their property rights? I think actually that uh, there has been a fundamental misconception about eco-fundamentalism because people think that this is a controversy between nature and man. But it is actually a, a, a controversy or a conflict between two groups of men that want to utilize resources in different ways. And let me give you an example from my own country, Iceland. We uh, do whaling. Uh, and the, uh, the American uh, environmentalists, they want to prohibit us from doing whaling and do all kinds of sanctions and so on on us. Now, is this really a, a controversy or conflict between whale and man? No, it is a controversy between two groups that want to utilize the whale stock in different ways. Uh, those who want to let it be roaming around in the sea so that they can retreat to the Caribbean in the winter time as they do, the whales, or those of us who want to uh, harvest the whales. You know, those are two groups that have two different uh, uh, concepts about it, but that is not the whole story. There is also another thing about it. It is that the whales, they have to feed in the Icelandic grounds. And the whales, they consume six million tons, according to marine biologists, of the krill and the small fishes and seafood. And we actually in Iceland, we harvest in our waters about one million tons of uh, fish. So what the environmentalists, the rich people who uh, pay to the Sierra Club, are, are trying to do is to let us feed their pets. You know, it is like if you would have a farmer that would drive his cows to the fields of another farmer and uh, feed on them, and, but prohibit uh, this other farmer from, from slaughtering the cows and using the hide and selling the meat. So uh, I think that there is a great misunderstanding uh, around about eco-fundamentalism. Now we have in the front. Thank you, thank you, Professor, very much. I, have, I was thinking of a few questions. I, I would like to, to start with the following. If I, su I suppose you would agree with me that probably the European Union currently has, you know, departed a little bit from its conservative, conservative liberal, liberal roots. If you agree with that statement, what do you think would be the, the reforms needed in order to go back to, to the origins of the European Union that in many ways were very liberal, very conservative, and, and, well, and very good as, as I see it? Thank you. This is such a, a large question that I would need a whole lecture to answer it, but I'll just give you the short version, and it is this. There was actually uh, an attempt or an experiment uh, similar to the um, European Union in the Danubian monarchy, in the Habsburg monarchy, and uh, it had its good sides, and uh, then uh, we should learn some lessons from it. The good thing about the Habsburg monarchy was that it was a common currency area, and it was a free trade area, and this is what the uh, European Union should be. But the problem was that there were all kinds of uh, uh, units, political units, uh, that, uh, and communities that uh, didn't have uh, self-government. And therefore, there was great discontent. They didn't feel at home. They didn't identify with uh, the state. And uh, the right thing would have been to do the same as Switzerland did in the mid-19th uh, century, which was to decentralize, to allow everybody who wanted to be in a political community to do so, uh, and uh, have as many cantons and have as many exit options as possible, because then the problem doesn't arise whether one group is uh, oppressing another group or forcing uh, their preferences on, on, on other people. This is what my, my friends in South Africa suggested. Uh, when I was in South Africa, a fascinating country, um, in 1987, uh, I uh, became a little bit uh, 
acquainted with their problems, and uh, two friends of mine there, Leon Löw and Francis Kendall, they wrote a, a book called South Africa, The Solution, where they said, we know that apartheid has to end. It is unjust. Uh, what we have to do are, is two things. We should privatize all public properties and use the proceeds to compensate uh, the oppressed. Uh, uh, <coughs> and then we should divide South Africa up into many cantons. Some cantons will be um, dominated by the blacks, some will be dominated by the Indians, some will be dominated by the colors, and some will be dom dominated by the whites. And if you feel ill at ease in one of these communities, you don't feel at home there, then you just move to another canton. And this is precisely how I, I see Europe. I see Europe uh, not as a closed state, but as an open market with self-chosen, spontaneous uh, decentralized uh, communities that may be evolving, and it's an open question uh, how they uh, evolve. And uh, there was a there was a uh, French philosopher of the uh, 19th century who, who said about the nation: What is a nation? It's a daily plebiscite or a daily referendum on where you do belong. So it it is a question that the liberal would leave leave open which is your political community. The liberal would only uh, believe in three principles. Uh, that's at least the argument in my book. And these three principles are private property, free trade, and limited government. Before we, we, we go with the question from the audience, I would like to ask you about property rights. I think that everybody here will agree. I think that a lot of people on the left and the right will agree on the on the importance of property rights, you, you've mentioned you've mentioned uh, the, the the Icelandic sheep and the elephants in the in Africa. So we we all know the importance of property rights. The West and America, for example, uh, bring freedom to the world all the time. But why don't we bring the uh, uh, f uh, let's say property rights in Africa for for so long? I I think actually we have. Uh, we have seen a, a, a miracle with a free market in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, we were discussing this, uh, you know, um, what would Mises and, you know, I don't want to be ruled from the graves, not at all. And uh, uh, Hayek and Mises were wonderful people and, uh, you know, we have to move on. However, I think it is very important to ask ourselves, wouldn't they be happy about seeing what uh, you know, has been taking place in the world with the extension of, uh, of economic freedom according to the interest of economic freedom, even if we have now suffered a, a temporary setback. Socialism has uh, totally failed. And Austrian economics, uh, you know, some people think that Austrian economics is something irrelevant. Not at all. Uh, it was a great success of Austrian economics. What happened in Italy, Germany, and Austria after the uh, Second World War, when Luigi Einaudi in Italy, uh, Reinhard Kamitz in Austria, and uh, Ludwig Erhard in Germany, they all re re reconstructed the societies on, on, on liberal principles, uh, and uh, there were economic miracles there. And then we had uh, the uh, Central and Eastern Europe with uh, Vasla Klaus and uh, Mart Lahr and Lesik Balserovic, uh, you know, they're making a miracle. And our guest of honor here is a good example of what can be accomplished. So I believe that Austrian economics uh, is still uh, very politically significant, and I am optimistic about this. I don't think we are losing. Uh, we may have to go one, uh, one uh, step back uh, in order to go two steps forward. In the middle, there is a gentleman. Uh, thank you. Uh, since you talk about um, uh, Europe after World War II, and you think about um, uh, Austria and Germany you were talking about, uh, part of that was kind of a uh, what they called a soziale Marktwirtschaft, yeah? uh, where there were certain um, basic things, like for example, in Austria, you've got this thing called the Sozialpartnerschaft, yeah? Everybody in Austria uh, uh, is signs uh, collective contracts, so certain minimum things like social insurance, um, 
vacations, things like that are sort of regulated. And because the companies don't have to compete against other companies that are under different uh, circumstances, uh, it does lead to a sort of uh, raising or ensuring of a large middle class. Now, do you see that kind of uh, that kind of interventionism as threatening the free market in the way that you're thinking? It is a very interesting question. Ludwig Erhard uh, said to uh, Hayek, and Hayek told me, and uh, of course many other people, that the reason he used the words uh, soziale Marktwirtschaft was simply to emphasize that Marktwirtschaft was in its nature, the market uh, order was in its nature social. Because, you know, competition is cooperation. Competition is that you and I, we trade to the mutual benefit of us, so there is no, no, no problem with it. However, there is perhaps a difference between the 24 hour, uh, authors, the 24 authors that I write about in my book, the conservative liberal authors, and uh, perhaps some American libertarians. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like them, I sympathy with them, I think they are very fresh and radical, and it's good to have that challenge from them. But they seem occasionally to hate the state on principle. They are hostile to the state. The conservative liberals, they want to limit the state, but the state has to, has to be strong where it has to be strong. It has to provide uh, law and order. And the special uh, circumstance in Germany after the war, and actually from the late uh, 19th century, the Bismarckian Germany was that there was so much monopoly capitalism in, in Germany. And this is what Walter Eucken and Wilhelm Röpke and uh, the other uh, liberal economists, uh, they, they saw. So for them, monopoly was uh, something that uh, the state had actively to campaign against. But I believe that the, the, that proposition of theirs or their proposal or their project was more a product of the special German circumstances than an integral part of the uh, conservative liberal project, because mostly um, competition will solve these problems. And that's what, what we have actually seen. Uh, the uh, innovations in technology and globalization have increased competition and not monopoly. With this, uh, I would like to thank Professor Gisurarsson and, um, and this uh, conference, I would like to invite Barbara and Federico for the closing remarks. Thank you, Professor.